Thank you. Uh, welcome to From Caliban to the Taliban, 500 Years of Humanitarian Intervention and Counting. Um, by way of introduction, uh, the genesis of the idea was suggested to me by a, a collision of random events starting a couple of years ago. I was um, driving through Albuquerque, listening to a late night radio phone-in. A woman calls up and she's going, I got all these Vietnamese moving into my neighbourhood, I don't like it. Too many of them. Vietnamese family living right next door to me. All these Vietnamese coming over here all the time. How would they feel? How would they feel if a whole bunch of Americans just decided to move into Vietnam? <laughs> Where do you begin? <laughs> How would they feel? Well, I imagine they'd probably spend the next ten years fighting a bitter defensive war, many of them living underground in a series of interconnected tunnels until, through a combination of military genius, ideological conviction and village solidarity networks, they achieve a spectacular victory of the greatest military superpower the world has ever known. But then, the United States realises that territory it's lost militarily it can still conquer economically, and so, using the IMF structural adjustment programmes, they prize open the Vietnamese economy to transnational banks and corporations, thus triggering the financial crisis which leads to the collapse of social welfare provisions, thereby causing doctors, nurses and teachers to migrate to the United States and look for work in branches of Dunkin' Donuts, <laughs> where they are paid wages so low they are forced to move in next door to ignorant white trash. <laughs> On my return to Blighty, the first thing I hear on Radio 4 is Newsnight's rising star Gavin Esler saying, and I quote, American foreign policy has always been an essentially moral affair. <laughs> ah, bless. <laughs> so these two things was rattling around in my mind and I was meditating upon uh, a collective awareness of, uh, a historical awareness. Uh, uh, um, these meditations, however, were interrupted when, um, when those two planes flew into the World Trade Centre on... I forget the date. <laughs> but, but I do remember, a couple of weeks later, there was this extraordinary uh, press conference. Uh, and it was quite widely reported at the time. There was a press conference... Well, there was a conference, uh, sort of a couple of meetings at, at the Pentagon, uh, um, or as it's known on the Quad, uh, between, on the one hand, it was... Um, uh, the, the, oh, all the Hollywood ideas people and the military defence uh, planners and strategists. And we were told in the corporate media at the time that the reason for this meeting between the uh, defence chiefs and the planners and the Hollywood ideas people and the executive producers was to help the, uh, uh, the military strategists envisage future possible terrorist scenarios, to calculate where the next threat might come from. They had these two uh, closed doors brainstorming sessions, the end of which there was a televised... Um, Pentagon press conference in which their spokesman was saying that only now, as a result of these meetings, did they fully appreciate the extent of the danger facing the United States. And in particular, they said they were deeply concerned by the very real possibility that Saudi-trained scientists, loyal to Al-Qaeda but resident in the United States, may already have developed the capability of using a DeLorean car powered by lightning <laughs> striking a church steeple to travel back in time to 1776 and change the words of the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> and the most nefarious, chilling aspect about this entire dastardly plot is were it to succeed, no one would know. You go back to the past, you muck about with things, people continue in the present, their memories are altered, thinking that's the way things always were. May already have happened. Americans may just wake up one morning and discover that they're living among a bunch of religious fundamentalists in the most dangerous rogue state on the face of God's earth, engaged in international terrorism and led by the unelected son of an oil billionaire, but think of this state of affairs completely normal. How would they feel? This conference may, of course, also have been the provenance of uh, the whole concept of Preemptive war. See, we're going after the Iraqis because their intelligence leads us to believe at some point in the future they may get hold of the components necessary to develop weapons that could one day be targeted against the United States. We're also going after a waitress named Sarah Connor. 
some point in the future she will give birth to a son named of John Connor, who will lead the resistance against the cyborgs of the military industrial complex and the Pentagon system. Capitalism being a killing machine and the humanitarianism of our interventions, the thin coating of human like flesh which allows us to pass among humans and only dogs bark. You see the analogy. <laughs> End of the uh, 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 press conference, the Pentagon spokesman adds a crocodile to the effect. He says, Oh, by the way, there was just one other reason for this meeting with the Hollywood people. We've set up a new government department called the Office of Global Communication, whose remit is to coordinate the foreign policy message and exactly how became clear on December the 5th at the Leonard H. Golderson Theatre in Los Angeles where the Academy of Arts hosted an invite-only symposium called Hollywood Goes to War, Politics, Showbiz and the War on Terror. Back projection, dictionary definition, propaganda, colon, words and images crafted to influence mass opinion and defeat enemies on a psychological Battlefield lights down. Kate Smith's crackly contralto 1920s recording of God Bless America played of a montage of Hollywood World War II films lights up. Bryce Zabel, chief executive of the Academy of Arts, call it propaganda. Public relations. Accentuating the positive or polishing the American brain. What role will the creative community play in the current crisis? Now, of course, all they're doing is renewing the pledge. But what's fascinating about this meeting to me is right from the off. There's loads of talk about the need to retell the American story. Why do people hate us? Because we haven't told them. The American story. We've got to get out there and retell the American story. And it put, it put me in mind of George Orwell uh, famously wrote, uh, who controls the present controls the past. Who controls the past controls the future. And whenever I think about those words, I always wish I knew what they meant. <laughs> so it cuts right to the heart of so many things. I, I wish to... I wish to say, I guess it means that the. I guess it means hanging on to the fact on uh, day seven of the invasion of Iraq, Operation PlayStation 2, cell through, you know, when they're <laughs> manufacturing the outrage against Al Jazeera. Knowing that on day three you'd seen ITN, CNN, BBC, Sky are all showing pictures of dead Iraqi soldiers and Iraqi POWs, but the point was they were prepping the psychological landscape for the bombing of. Al Jazeera and the Palestine Hotel and the Iraqi media centre, very pleased they never scored a direct hit there because there's a big Mohammed Said al sahaf shaped hole in my life where the Iraqi information minister used to be. You know, the British Army, they're very poor, their equipment is very shabby, very old, and what is more, they have no money to buy new equipment. They are very poor, very, and they're so poor, the British Army. A major in the British Army had to go on television, have his wife cough during Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? <laughs> also, the aggressors, the imperialists, the aggressors have not taken Saddam Hussein International Airport today for maybe two minutes, but we've retaken it, crushed and killed them. And not only, not only have we retaken Saddam Hussein International Airport, we are now also in control of Miami and Detroit as well. <laughs> we now own Tam Le Motown Records. You want to speak to Stevie Wonder, you come to me. <laughs> Then they was uh, prepping the psychological landscape for the mass slaughter of civilians. Remember, they get to the edge of Baghdad, famous soundbite, this does not look like our war gaming led us to believe. So they order up the 12,000 pound cluster bombs, the daisy cutters. Takes about a week to roll those heavy mothers up the road from Basra. The corporate media has a week to earn their fucking whack. And that's when we get those streams of interviews with American GIs all saying, so these so-called Iraqi civilians came towards us terroristically. <laughs> and then these super civilians started shooting at us and we believe they may have been members of the Fedayeen. The Fedayeen, oh, the evil Fedayeen, the Fedayeen, the Fedayeen, the evil Fedayeen. The home guard is what they were. <laughs> Somewhere on the banks of the Euphrates was a short, bald, round bloke with glasses saying, now pay attention to the uh, What we're going to do is uh, set fire to the oil trenches. I said, do you think that's awfully wise, sir? <laughs> I, mean, I, I can't help thinking it will make the air frightfully smoky. <laughs> uh, uh, my sister Dolly has terrible asthma. <laughs> so I think what Orwell means is that the battle between people and power is the battle between the memory and forgetting. Aqaba, where they've launched this kind of... Uh, you know, mid late latest roadmap for P. They say that the oil companies aren't involved. They get who's giving away the fucking free